we're going to talk a little bit about ballot papers and why they matter today. And in front of us, we have some magnified versions of ballots from uh, both Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. And let's see what uh, they can tell us. I, I will start out by bringing this uh, slightly magnified version of a, the election in Sweden 1921. Uh, Christina, when you look at this ballot, what do you see? Um, I see a ballot paper that's fairly easy actually to use for the voter. Um, I see um, certain types of information. It's a carrier of information about a specific party, Arbetare Partiet. But it also holds all the candidates at the ballot paper. So already in 1921, we have the, the archetype, I would say, of the Swedish ballot paper today. And at the very top, we have Jalmar Branting, uh, who became the Swedish prime minister later on. Mm. And that is a ballot from one of the uh, districts. And this is from the same election, the same party, but a different district. It looks quite different. Why is that? Yes. Actually, in, in 1920, uh, there had been an electoral reform uh, that said that as of 1921 or 1920, you have to have a, a party name on the ballot paper. That was not the case before. But apart from that, the ballot paper could be a variety of sizes. It could have um, no names as long as it had a party name on it. So you had very little uh, restrictions as to the, the layout of the actual ballot paper. Mm -hmm. But it had to be white, even though this is slightly grayish. Uh, it had to be white. That was the only criteria. Okay, but this, then, if we fast forward 50 years yeah. uh, until, un until 1968 or 70, things changed quite dramatically. Yes. And we have an example here of a of one party. What, what do we have here? Well, uh, in, in 1970 there was an electoral reform. Uh, suddenly we had joint election days in Sweden. So we had to distinguish between the ballot papers since uh, all three elections on local, regional and national levels took place in one and the same day. So it meant that uh, the ballot papers couldn't all be white because you wouldn't be able to distinguish between them in between the elections. So suddenly we got color and suddenly we got these markings in the corner because now we put them in envelopes. Oh, so that, you didn't do that before? It no, new. yes. And um, this was a security measure to make sure that the right uh, voter voted in the elections that he or she was entitled to vote in. So different countries have different security measures and this was the Swedish one. Mm. Mm. And these markings in the corners actually uh, was to make sure that uh, the, the right ballot paper with the right color was used. Because uh, two lines you had cut off corners, so you checked in the corner that it had two lines. That was for the national parliament. One uh, black line was from, for, for the local election and no line for uh, the regional election. So. Suddenly, these layouts of the ballot paper became very, very important. And so many features surrounding the ballot paper uh, had to be regulated. Hmm. So even though there is a rather strict heritage from the earlier ballots that we could see, there is still a much higher regulation on what we see here. So visually it looks different, but regulatory it's quite different. Yes, that's true. If you look at this paper, it just holds the party name and some candidates, and it could vary in size and, and format. Suddenly you have to put everything in, in an envelope with the, exactly the same size. And we had three elections in one of the same day. So yes, you had to have these markings and you had other information apart from parties and candidates. You need also to have other information at the ballot paper. Here it says election to the national parliament and also you have to mark uh, the geography, whether or not it, it, it was for a specific constituency in Sweden. So, yes, so much more information in this little ballot paper was needed. 
So when the Swedish government decides to change the ballots in, in 1970, who are the different sort of stakeholders in this paper? Because me, I, I only go to the elections when it's uh, election day and then I, I, I put the envelope uh, for whom I want. But there are several other stakeholders that also uh, are interested in, in this little paper. Who, who are they? Well, and what do they need? Well, apart from, uh, apart from the voter, this is the carrier of the voter's intention, and that is the number one. But then again, the same paper is actually used to, to calculate uh, the result. It's the basis of the, the election result. But you also have stakeholders uh, in terms of the, the election administration. Uh, suddenly a small piece of paper needs to be printed, it needs to be distributed, and uh, it, it needs also to be understood. But it also represents, I would say, the electoral system uh, as such, and the varieties of ways people have to cast a vote. If you want to have a system with advanced voting, for example, and you don't vote in your election uh, station on E-Day, well, you might need another ballot paper than the one designated for your ordinary polling station because you vote in another part of the country. So it means that the, the design system has to take into consideration the varieties that people have to vote in each specific case. Hmm. Okay, and now since this system was introduced to us, it has passed yet another uh, 50 years since we next year are celebrating 100 years of democracy in Sweden, which is quite fantastic. fantastic. And we have changed uh, once during this period. But uh, now there has been a, a debate on maybe updating things. Here are the last uh, uh, ballot papers from 2018 for, for two Swedish parties. Slightly smaller than normal, actually, in this case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and what do we see here? Well, what we see is, uh, I can show you two pieces of ballot papers. What we see is that the, at the top you have the party name and suddenly this can be printed in color and you can use also a symbol. And a symbol is there for accessibility reasons, really. Um, and then we have had a personal voting uh, reform, meaning that you are allowed to, to uh, uh, give a preference vote on the ballot paper. It means that all the candidates listed here, they have a teeny weeny square <laughs> where you can mark your personal vote uh, and you may mark one in, in this case. And as you see, you have similar information that is administrative information as the previous one from 1970, but uh, the lines have changed places. Uh, Nowadays, the envelopes used to have their control uh, hole, I would say, uh, in the middle of the envelope instead. So yes, they have changed and they have become a little bit more accessible when it comes to the party name. But still, the font is really very small. <laughs> but the one thing we can conclude from this is that in a stable democracy as Sweden's, uh, things doesn't change very much. There are nuances of changes rather than big transformation. I would say so. And, and the examples that we see here from 1920 and onwards, they show that uh, Sweden has been very fond of, of uh, the so-called French system, which is a party unique ballot paper system. Each party will have their unique ballot. Uh, and um, even though we've had reforms, uh, the, the way that the, the voters' intention is displayed on the ballot paper hasn't changed that much in so many years. But, okay, so we have this French system that we have been using, but the country most similar to Sweden probably in the world, Finland, <laughs> I mean, it's very similar. Or Denmark. Or Denmark. No. They have chosen completely different ways. Yes. Isn't that strange? Because they are also very stable democracies. Yes. And, but High literacy levels, etc. Yes. Um, it's rather remarkable, really, that uh, Sweden, Denmark and, uh, and Finland have chosen completely different uh, layouts and completely different systems on how to look upon the ballot paper. 
But let's look at the Finnish ballot. There you go, Christina. Well, it's just a blank piece of paper. Um, but if you fold it out, you have administrative information. This is election to a certain in a certain year to parliament, and we have a circle. Now, in normal cases in Finland, you write the, the voter writes his attention by stating a number, and the number represents a party and a candidate in one and the same number. But this voter's intention is clearly different. I have to say that this was not uh, valued as a valid ballot paper, but it's a really very funny example on how the voter's intention can be expressed in another way than maybe the administration was expecting. So, Superman, here we come. And the, the Finnish system is based upon on this thing that you put yes. inside the, the ballot box, yes. but also another, the, the list on the wall, yes. where then all the numbers of the candidates are stated. As for the voter, uh, compared with Sweden, where you have everything printed on the ballot paper in terms of party and candidates, uh, this one is blank. It has no party information whatsoever. It means that the voter has to receive that information from another place than the actual surface of the ballot. Um, and that is uh, done by placing enormous amounts of posters at both advanced voting places and uh, in polling stations on E-Day. So the voter has direct access to the number of the candidate he or she would like to vote for and easy to remember to place that number on the ballot. So it's uh, a completely different system when it comes to the layout, but they do have a system based on multiple parties and multiple candidates. So this is how they do it. And just like Sweden, they of course come extremely high in these international indexes of democracy. It shows that there are many ways forward in a way. Yes. Uh, and also in, in Finland, as in Sweden, um, they've had this system for a very, very long time. Um, and also notable is that it has always required the voter to be able to hold a pen and write a number. Uh, and that's not uh, obvious in, in some other countries. In Sweden, you must be able to read, you must be able to, to place a cross, and you might be able to, to have to write the party name in case you don't find the party you want to vote for. You can use a blank ballot paper and write. But in ordinary voting cases in Sweden, you have everything on, the, on a ballot paper. But Finland chose another direction. But let's look at the Danish version. Yes. They have chosen another path. It's somewhere sort of in between Sweden and Finland, you could say. Yes. This is a ballot paper that holds all the political parties and all the candidates for that specific constituency. It means that the voter will have everything on one piece of paper. You don't have to, to read in advance or, or choose between a variety of, of parties outside of the polling booth. This is what you get when you come into the polling station and the, the thing you have to do is to, to be able to read and to be able to place a cross for your political party and for your candidate. The, the Danes seem to be very fond of their system. They think it's really good when I I think speak many to countries are <laughs> fond of their systems. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, but they are. Uh, and, but Denmark is also a, a smaller country. I, I think that uh, this also ties in with the choice of, of a ballot paper, um, whether or not it has to be printed in enormous amounts or whether or not it's printable locally or, or centrally or in any other country. Um, I think it matters also that all these surrounding qualities, whether or not you, you, you choose to go in a certain direction, we have looked at a number of uh, ballots from different times and from different countries. So if we would like, if we would sort of try to aggregate this information to you, Christina, what does a ballot represent? For me, the ballot is actually the heart of every election. Uh, it is the carrier of information for the election administration when it comes to what's on it. Should it be parties, candidates or nothing at all? Um, but for the voter, it has a clear symbolic value because it has the voter's intention there. 
And also, um, I would say that it carries the election result. Because without this, without the voters' intention and without a ballot paper that can be readable and countable, uh, we won't have an election result. So I, I think it has a huge uh, symbolic value. Hmm. And you have gone around and, and watched this exhibition. What, what does it make you think? Um, I think that uh, you have such a variety of systems depending on what countries uh, are at hand, what, uh, in what stage of development they're in. But it becomes very evident to me that, that there are challenges and there are big challenges that will not only affect one or two countries but many countries. Um, the first uh, challenge that strikes me is that we need to, to make uh, the ballots more accessible. And it becomes very evident, for example, the, the size of the fonts, the actual size of the ballot paper, very small to very large, that could have an accessibility impact. But also how the contestants are uh, presented to the voter, how easy is it to vote? Um, and, and I think that we might want to rethink how to use the surface of the ballot or the ballot paper in order to find uh, alternatives or ways of, of uh, enhancing accessibility to make it easier not only to vote but also to count and to get uh, a correct result without invalid ballot papers. Um, the second challenge has to do with paper. It becomes very evident that uh, the, this exhibition has to do with ballot papers. And today we have uh, environmentally concern uh, when it comes to how much paper is actually produced in the world. We need to decrease that. And also the fact that less and less material printed today. So this is uh, something that will directly impact uh, the, the elections, I would say. And I know that many countries already today have this on the agenda. Mm. Uh, but the easy way uh, to think might be, oh yes, yes, let's go digital. But I think that uh, there are hesitations uh, to, to go digital or at least to do it very quickly. So what we need to do is to try to find alternatives that's more environmentally sound, I would say, uh, without uh, digitalizing the ballot. Okay, so hearing this, the million dollar question, yes. is there a perfect ballot? No. Oh. <laughs> I think that in each system you can always refine uh, a ballot, depending on what values you would like the ballot to, to achieve. And there are so many considerations that must be taken into account when, when designing uh, a ballot. And those values might look different between countries. So one ballot might be perfect for one country, but uh, a disaster for another. Well, thank you very much, Christina, for uh, visiting the exhibition and sharing your insight about ballots and elections. Thank you for having me.